welcome. This is Tevo DRC from Tevo Creative Leadership. We're out here in the real life realm, the barista fellowship gathered in from the cold. We're so glad that here in South Carolina, we don't have to wear the mask at all times, though we do try to submit to the authorities when they want us to, because we understand they want to keep the law, but also some people are really frightened. And so we're so thankful that God has given me peace and rest. And that's one thing I want to say. I've been writing a lot. I know I've been writing a lot about the LP, the wealth, <laughs> Western European political patriarchism, that subservient, bossy, you know, the autocrat of patriarchism. I'm not trying to be like that at all. But I also want to say that we are so thankful for men. I really appreciate and respect men in general, the Christian men, the non-Christian men, but I'm talking to the Christian men every time I deal with my broadcasts. I even have, sort of put to the side, but I've got tclharddrive.com, a man's uplifting men's ministry. But when I get the word of the Lord, I get a move upon me to, to mention whatever I've been doing lately to discuss the Eli Temple I priesthood, the wealth, I also want to make sure that not all white patriarchs, not all white matriarchs have the same characteristics as Eli or dominating, controlling, and if they're Christian, they're not into spooky spiritual. So I want to say I honor all the different kinds of fathers and the different kinds of men that are leaders. My father was a Christian pastor and he was not in the Levitical patriarchism, he was not under shepherding. And my mother was a strong lady, but I just felt like they were both so emotionally mature that even though God has used me through the decades, many decades now, all my life to study and research his people, the ones that believe the Bible, the ones that accept Jesus as Lord, and then you bump into all other kinds along the way, but my focus was to say, what is the Lord saying through the different kinds of Christians, black or white? Then I'm in the field, or I'll be sent, not drumming up business, not trying to find anything, but I'd be sent because there'd be new types of movements through the years. And so I'd be sent there, and many times I was, I didn't know it till lately, but I was like a weeping Hannah, on the front porch of many a temple. And it was because of the pain in my life of just, you know, I've been raised with a happy father. So I knew what normal was, but I had emotional abuse and a critical accusation, demonic spirit for a lot of that time. And God, thank God for good people and good people with good teaching. And that's, you know, it was going on sometimes like Paul if you have an apostle call, a chief apostle, you do get abundance of the revelations and you do have to press into the Lord. And then at the same time, you can have affliction and sifting and persecution and a Saul and David, and you can have all sorts of things because you have to be purified and you have to get your heart right. And you have to know that you are um, in a progress, a process. And that's it. Many times when people are in a process, they're not taught that that is just the Christian life. If you're going to mature, that he wants disciples that follow him, not the money, follow him, take up their cross daily, serve him, do what he says. Don't do anything more, don't do anything less, just obey the Lord. Many times through the years, we know how a lot of people, a lot of Christian ministries have taken something that was taught and made a formula, tried to make a formula prophetic or faith or whatever, money or whatever. We're not trying, I'm not trying to do that. I've been around it. I've been through it. I've passed by it. I just felt like you live and learn and nobody who's taught these movements from the grassroots up that is now famous or that is on their way ever arrived. And nobody was perfect. And the ones that are really the famous ones, I guess you call them famous, they know that it's the followers that get their stuff in the grassroots is my term and maybe they mix it with other stuff or they're mad with their mama or they hate people that are not just like themselves or they're racist or they're you know weird doctrine and circulating like all this phariseeism that's to me where phariseeism wealth originated in certain places you know 
it gets off into unforgiveness. It gets off into a lot of things that are not the normal Christian Billy Graham, even the top leaders probably of what we call the wealth movements. I'm sure that if you investigate the head people of the organic movement, which I believe somewhere in the deep south, that either you'll find the proof that these people <laughs> had some issues, great issues, <laughs> bias and misogyny being one, and wealth, or else somebody took their stuff decades, centuries ago, and, you know, morphed it, goofed it up, and then the devil got in there as well. So we have no animosity. We have no histrionics against any type of person or male or female Christian leader group. But we have to say that as one that was Holy Spirit divinely led, my whole family, they weren't charismatics, but we were led, they were seers, but nobody thought of that. Nobody knew that when you're Presbyterian or you're Baptist, they just had the gift, you know, like Native Americans, a lot of Native Americans and persecuted tribes, they have developed their inner perceiver gift. And I don't know, but my grandmother on my mother's side was, a, you know, I guess they'd say that she, she would be a intercessor today because she really was one but it was not in the charismatic sense but she heard the Lord you know one time when I was growing up my grandmother lived in Alabama we moved up to Central Virginia when I was a little kid so my dad will have a church and they taught school and everything a little town outside of Richmond so my grandmother and I would go out sometimes when I visit her in Alabama with my parents and we'd go out and she'd drive around and she'd pray for parking spaces. Like when I was four years old, I remember my grandmother, Boo, my mother's mother and intercessor. She just, you know, she's suddenly very, very gifted intellectually, very brilliant, but she had no common sense, but she would. And so this ties in with that. So she would pray for a parking spot and we would get it. And that dawned on me when I was four, man, you pray God answers. But it was simple, it wasn't spooky. One day when I was, I guess 11, because my sister had been born, and one day we were up in Virginia and my grandmother arrived, Boo, we called her Marie Simmons, and her mother called Bam, called Bam, Bam and Boo. So Bam and Boo, Bam was a very genteel lady. <laughs> a genteel lady. And so my, you know, I come from genteel ladies, basically, that were prayer people and Christians and not taking themselves too seriously, not burdened by it, not burdened with their ministry, not burdened by their, you know, they were social and natural people, happy people. And Ephesians 5, 21, mutual submit in the fear of the Lord and their family. That's all. So I come from that perspective. Thank God, a happy human perspective as well. So anyway, one day I was, remember my grandmother who had great intellectual skill. She had taught herself how to read, you know, the first woman, one of the few women that graduated from the university, uh, we call it West Hampton College and taught herself all these languages. But yet she could not have a lot of common sense. Like my mother and my grandmother, that mo grandmother and my mom could not cook. They just could not cook. They wanted to, they could not cook. I can cook, but I had to develop it because it wasn't in my hard drive growing up. So anyway, when they arrived, we were in Virginia. I was sitting on the screening porch with my mother and bam and boo, bam and boo, arrived in the driveway, <laughs> driving up <laughs> from Alabama to Virginia. And the story is that boo, the grandmother, my grandmother, the aunt, she had driven on the wrong side of the road for miles and miles, but God gave her grace to get there. That was the story that she had driven, found out later she was on the, it's just terrible, but that was back then, you know, way back then. So God was good and it wasn't all, that's why I'm trying to be normal, a bit normal, a toe, all, you know, I don't have to be normal, but I can be, try to be natural. That's what we want, to be low key, down to earth, and then switch on what you need to do if you're, you know, the Lord says. But I think if we can have ministry now, real ministry, basically find one foot or a toe that you can touch real life normal. That means you're relatable, 
equal opportunity, real respect, not bias. And you can also have a lot of joy in the middle middle of any kind of big trouble. And believe me, I have had big trouble, but because of Holy Spirit and the Lord and the Bible and the word of God and faith and all these wonderful things that have been in the body of Christ in America for decades, it has been God allowing me and many, many people like this, sort of an Enoch type walk in the body of Christ, fellowship of his sufferings, fellowship with other people, fellowship with real Christians in groups. If you can find a group that is, you know, pretty safe in the seats, but we're four and we're really very positive. So I wanted to say that I really say all is well, all is well, but I really thank God for the men, the Christian men, because I know a lot of people are under fire accusation. You got stress, you got drama, you got ministry, you got family, you got all these things. And one of the reasons I think that, uh, you know, when help me be strong, because there is no female lone woman, you know, I didn't know I'd be lone, but even when I was married, uh, I was the only minister, but it was like, oh yeah, that's your, that's your call. I have business. And that was how we did it. Not a big deal to the, to us, to other people who judged or wouldn't ask or didn't have the same philosophy. You know, they've got legalism. They've got thou shalt not all over them. Uh, I wasn't legalistic. So we take it one day at a time, one person at a time, one call at a time and figure it out yourself privately. And so my thought was that we need to do this now, that the basic thing with Christianity that has started in the last, since television ministry started maybe, and it affected the grassroots where all you live, is this keeping up with the Joneses, FOMO, that's the latest word for keeping up with the ministry Joneses, fear of missing out, keeping watch. Yeah, I've got to be like that. i got to have pressure to perform. And when I was coming up from a life that was pretty happy and normal, and when I got ministry and I had gotten the Holy Spirit, it was in my own ministry and a lot of faith teaching back then in the grassroots of back where I live, learning the Holy Spirit, learning the curb, you know, figuring out my call and my doctrine, having accountability, which I've always had. Um, what I didn't know is that when TV came, you know, many, what, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, big Christian TV came and Charisma Magazine, not putting it on Charisma but I'm, as a fault, but I mean, there has been an effect, a tremendous effect of the celebrity and the need to perfect put yourself out there as a certain package. And the pressure on the grassroots, where I was, there were little ministries in the central rural area. I'd lived in Cosmopolitan and I'm happier there. I was in Norfolk, Virginia Beach, Dallas, all these places. But I'm, and up here is really pretty cosmopolitan, except low, low key. So I'd been around cosmopolitan and that's me, happier. But when I was in the rural Virginia area, it was more, it was no celebrity at that time. But then we, we were there sort of in this grassroots desert because of the, you know, the, just there was at the time. And we were glad to have Trinity Broadcast. We were glad, no Daystar. We had Trinity Broadcasting and I was out there and I'd had a, a moral compass and a ministry compass instead sort of a white collar Baptist family seminary graduate, but I was out with people and it's not anyone better or worse that had no collar or maybe just a rough collar before they got saved. Not saying all, but they were genuine. They were really trying hard. And so as a result, I was in my own office with the helpers and I had a presence then for many years. And I saw myself, because you have to evaluate something new is going to come down the pike all the time, media or around your lifestyle. So when before TV, and then you get the Jim Baker and you get all the gyms, it started to mushroom. So charisma comes out. And I remember all the pictures. They used to take pictures. They, I don't even want to do anything like that. I don't look at it. I don't want to know, really. Uh, but I remember that it was the thing in the grassroots because they started advertising conferences with all the people and their plan, you know, the bishop and the apostle, and that's when it started to take off, frankly. And so that, oh yeah, we're new at this. 
this is brand new and it isn't a sin, but maybe that's how God is using it these days. And you question because you're young, you don't know. And therefore you get into this easily fall into not knowing it, this Hollywood or this need to say, well, I've got to look this way. I've got to put it this way or nobody will think I'm credible. God won't be pleased because I'm not as professional. And it's right now I've carved that out as like, okay, that was then, this is now, I'm just going to be me. I think it's great in a way to have heroes. I've had heroes. I've needed to have some role models. I've never depended upon them, never tried to think I was putting them on an idol. To me, my dad is my one I treasure right now. He wasn't famous, but he was real. He was normal. He laughed. And, that's, and he was low-key servant leadership. But I know how it is because I've been there what they call or used to call professional ministry, small, mini, micro to mega. God didn't want me moved or you moved by it. But there is a poverty spirit now in ministry. It is a poor me, victim, oh, they're offended. That's really LP. Oh, they're offended. Oh, they're always wounded. Listen, that is a certain kind of field of doctrine and teaching that is pop psychology in ministry. Dr. Philistine, Dr. Phil in ministry, and it is in the deep Southwest like I never wanted to know. It minimizes relationship. It is not evil. It is not sin. We have other kinds as well, but... The bottom line, if you've tried to find fellowship, if you were beaten up, if you were hurt and you wanted to talk to somebody, just get counsel or even get prayer so that you would be, you know, iron sharpens iron and evaluate or weep with those who weep. That's all I need. Usually if I'm, I will do my own inner work. I've had family I can talk to, ideal, you know, and I forgive everybody real fast. But when you're forced into a new area and you're by yourself, you think, I want community, and I was forced into this horrible ambush divorce. Not prepared. It was a Malachi 2 and a 1 Corinthians 7.15 type, which is not my fault. Too bad. Too bad. The LPs want to, woman to have done it, you know. So when I was down there as a mature Christian for many generations of Christians and a minister for 15, 20 years before that, I'd been around the bush and I knew how to do it. If I get hurt, you forgive, you say, Lord, you show me what to do and that's what I do. But as a person who had lost family, I was looking for a relationship that had empathy and compassion. What is the old timey word? The old timey, my dad used to preach one of them, Jesus wept in John, the shortest Bible verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. He wept with empathy and compassion for the leader sisters who were grieving the loss of their brother, the sudden loss of their brother, a death. Now, today, they think those women had, they were time-wasting, overly emotional and baggage. But even though Jesus, the prophetic Messiah, knew probably that it was going to be just fine, that Lazarus was going to be raised, everything was going to be back again, he still, the Bible teaches us, as a loving, caring, compassionate, empathetic minister, the Savior, he didn't feel that they were little teeny, you know, weepy, overly emotional time wasters. He didn't make them feel like they were stupid or trying to take his valuable Messiah time before his next appointment, which is how you feel. He didn't say, all right, sisters, you must have unforgiveness baggage toward God or Lazarus. You better go to the fix them fast class, which is what they were doing everywhere in the whole area, if you wanted the Holy Spirit. So what I realized was where I'd come from in Virginia and all my life, it had been down, it wasn't like celebrity or this doctrine back then. And I thought, we're used to having a toe in normal. Weep with those who weep. Mourn with those who mourn. Don't just diagnose them. You couldn't tell a soul that you had been assaulted, rape attempt outside your family because if they were professional 
red state country, all this, this wealth doctrine in the spirit field is like, they pull back. It's a sin, a sin, and you've got, quote, to be fixed. Those are the two things that I think are so horrible. They want to fix you instead of relate. People in that, and they're not E-O-R-R, -R, it's the woman. Levitical patriarchism in the same thing. It is the woman who did it. It is the woman who gets demeaned. It is the woman who spied from afar. It is the Jezebel out of order. I could go into, I went to some that were, I thought were not LP. I can go in there and if that spirit, that demeaning, misogynist spirit of accuser of the stranger is in there, it will find me. It may not come at once. But if it comes, like I, there was one group that was really young, right before I left, they're really nice. And gen, genteel, nice young church. And I liked, I thought I liked going. Till, two things. I notice, because I can scan people, you know, they've, I've been scanned so much, I have to do it as my own defense. I know that spirit, it recognizes me, and I get accused. I don't do anything, I get accused by this spirit. It'll talk about me, it will never confront. That's the other part. So I saw leadership, I thought they look fine, those nice young men, they're very quality, mature people, nice people at that church. I like going. So one day, new people, a speaker came in and I looked at him from another movement, he'd come down there. I thought, uh-oh, the wealth, the scanning, white well ego well i went uh-oh i hope this i've enjoyed my time here i don't want to leave but if i'm going to be whatever that spirit is that spies this hannah on the front steps the test case for well i will warn you everybody this isn't going to happen anymore god is going to move when there's false accusation never get confronted Everybody believes the evil report because one lone gossip or one lone hard-hearted misogynist spreads the word that that looks like a Jezebel from afar, but they never know you. God is not going to settle for that. Be ye careful and warned. God has equal opportunity, real respect. That's why he chose the lone Hannah in 1 Samuel to test the Eli the Eli Templeite priesthood were jaded and misogynist, and he sent her alone. She was weeping, so she looked weak. And her husband, nobody t asked her. Nobody found her backstory. Her husband loved her and said, you go to worship if that makes you feel better. Hannah was being persecuted and demeaned at home by the other wife. Eli Caesar, the LP, and in first, he sees this woman weeping on the front steps. And he sees her grieving and he looks like her jaded. And he says, oh no, a typecast, she's drunk. So instead of having compassion, he zeroed in on accusation and he labeled her a stereotype. She's a drunk. He accused the lone woman on the steps. And that is exactly, well, exactly. He didn't want to get up and spend time. He was too tired. He perceived her as having emotional baggage. And he was LP, which is misogynist disrespecter of women. How do we know that? First of all, that maybe. But the other, that his two sons, the associate ministers, whom he never corrected, were his sons. Those were LPs because they slept with the women, used the women repeatedly, demeaned the women, God's women that came to the temple and also abused the offering by putting too much pressure and taking it themselves. So the lone woman is a relationship issue. The using of the women and demeaning and defiling God's women, his women by the men in the priesthood is a huge, huge relationship issue. And so if there is an issue in the men, it is there is an issue in the leaders, males or females, and I don't have an issue, I don't want to be demeaned and respected by having you project your evil on me. You're a witch watcher. That is accusing, not assessing. Now, if, if anybody says I, they assess people, it's fine. I assess her as looking like she's in rebellion. I assess that he looks like he's a witch, a male witch. 
I assess they look like they're the Eli Temple High Priesthood. But I'm not going to know you are until you act like it. And so I believe in assessing, not accusing. But I also don't believe in devaluating a figure that shows up that looks like me, the typical stereotype of the whelp community, and putting your projecting your evil, dark and misogynist, collaborative stereotype from 50 years ago. I've had a lot of experience. I, I mean, I didn't want to get on this because I really like, I wanted to be positive. And thank God for those that are not. I meet them all the time. But when I have a national call, a national Christian warning about their phobias, about their spectral vibes, spooky spectral, and calling it prophetic seer when it's really occult, psychic, evil eye, witch watching, and then scanning people repeatedly that you never speak to. In fact, you don't want them to speak to you because you bristle and act so tough. It is a carnal, demonic relationship violation and relationship accusation type thing in ministry. And it is common, very common. That's why I'm speaking of a national movement going on. I have a national reproving movement. I have a national love you movement. Forgive you and everybody will be fine. I have a national, international ERR call to teach respect to the pastors and ministers and me. Keep me being good. James 3.17, easily entreated, full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Hey, I scare them off with their wealth. They wouldn't know if I'm nice or not. So I'm trying to be that bold and that fair because I realize how many people I look like that maybe you'll be scared the next time you see a strange blonde tall lady come in. You'd be scared to be that misogynist. You'll be scared to um, gossip about her and say she's, you know what, the evil creature you think they all are. You'll be scared because you're going to think all these ladies because you can't tell. You're so, the Eli Temple I priesthood is so and the women are so dull of discerning. That's why I'm teaching this pointedly and line by line. If you think, especially Dallas was the worst. I couldn't go in there. It was many things, but anyway. So maybe now when somebody comes with the middle-aged typecast, the misogynist hate, the lone woman, the grieving, widow, all these types of things, then you'll think it's me and you will be careful because you better be careful. I mean it. I'm saying it on behalf of many people, really for Jesus, because we want Jesus' house to be safe and happy. And I really care for the ministers. If I talk about wealth, 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 you know, I really have think they have great, some great qualities and they're very meticulous and they have a lot of good Holy Spirit quality teaching which is not biased. But if there's an undercurrent of non-servant leadership, it's now elite aristocracy and they're look down on anybody hurting. They look down on Jesus if he came in carrying the cross in Isaiah 53. That's a test. Apostle Paul, not famous or announced, he comes in staggering and looking shabby because he just got off the shipwreck. Or if they had somebody that had been under great persecution in Somalia or another nation that was just getting here from America and was just exhausted and their whole family was just about filled with poverty. They'd been beaten for their faith. And that hellish spirit of accusation, condemnation, and judging of far off disapproval that Eli Temple High Priesthood ego or whatever dull of discerning lost its first love male or female black or white so that's why i'm saying it we're for the body we're for the, all of the kinds i want to uplift you i don't want to have to think about this stuff dark stuff but i will do it in our ministry my ministry i'm going to teach i call it the perceiver's voice of victory Keep that joy. Let's keep that 
non snarky attitude out. Let's try to keep it a little more relatable down to earth. Part that, this part Pentecostal, part happy camper, part, you know, not have this phobia, a phobia, the phobic typecast, black or white or brown or male or female. So I'm here being very lovable. I'm very lovable and easily entreated, but I've gotten sort of, I realized I wasn't brought up mean. I didn't realize I had to learn how to be a little drill sergeanty because of the opposition of Christian ministers. I didn't know I had to get my mean on to visit with some of you and your well, some of these autocratic Jezebel speaking whatever, and some of the egos and good old boys in the mix of that as well, charlatans. So I didn't know it, but I went to Dallas. I graduated. I graduated, I graduated with high honors. I really did. I got three degrees, and I still am smiling and sweet. Not perfect, but sweet, joyful, filled with joy. I got my three degrees in Dallas. Fifteen years it took to get three degrees in Dallas in ministry. One. PhD, pretty hard days. The second one, PhD, piled high and deep. The third PhD is DFW degree, Dallas finest, and it's worst. Okay. I also had a honorary degree in in music, you know, sacred music from before, but that you know, DFW was you can't beat that. I really earned those too. So God is good, his mercy endures, he forgives, he sifts, he heals, he forgets. God bless you. This is Tavo the RC signing off for now. Let's see how I do it. Let's, there it is. All right.